I live in Guatemala and I work throughout Latin America. And I want to speak to the millions of fortunate Hispanic immigrants living in the United States, legally or not. I have a question for you. Why do you support the same policies in the US that cause you to flee your home country? The policies I'm talking about are those that lead to a bigger and bigger central government. You know only too well that the more power the government has, the more corrupt it becomes. My home country, like most other nations in Central and South America, is very poor. 54% of the population lives in poverty and 13% live in extreme poverty. Half of all children under five are chronically malnourished. Crippling government corruption is the norm. Opening a new business can take months, even years, because of a multitude of regulations that are designed to line the pockets of bureaucrats. So the cost is much too high for the average citizen. Quite simply, unless you're politically connected in Guatemala, you probably want to leave. And in the last 20 years, many Guatemalans have left. Or to put it more honestly, they fled. The fortunate ones reached the United States, the freest and wealthiest nation in human history. There are at least one million Guatemalans living in the US. Nearly every Mexican and Central and South American immigrant in the United States, whether they immigrated legally or illegally, moved or fled to the US for the same reasons, economic opportunity and the freedom to shape their own lives. In short, you came to the United States to participate in what Americans call the American dream. But have you ever asked yourself, why is the United States so free, so much less corrupt, and so much more affluent than any Latin American country? The answer lies first and foremost in the unique American belief in limited government. Why? Because the smaller the government, the less the corruption. And the smaller the government, the more individual freedom and personal responsibility. And given those things, along with hard work and talent, you can accomplish your life's goals. So back to my question, why would you support policies that keep expanding the power of the government when they are the very policies that doom your home countries? Is it because you think that when Democrats offer you free stuff, it means they really care about you? Do you think that when Republicans talk about enforcing immigration laws, it means they are going to send you back? Let's be honest. You didn't come here for free stuff. You came for the economic opportunity that allows you to work and earn. And of course, a nation has an obligation to enforce its borders. Certainly, every country in Central and South America does. In fact, much more so than the US. Perhaps you believe that your home country is poor not because of failed socialism and corrupt big government, but because of issues unrelated to ideology. Not enough natural resources, imperialism, and so on. Or worse, you believe that the US has gotten rich on the backs of poor nations. But these narratives are false. There are many nations blessed with abundant natural resources that are poor. And they are poor overwhelmingly because of corrupt governments and policies that destroy incentives to produce. Look at Venezuela, which has vast oil and mineral reserves, but has shortages of every basic necessity. Why? Because of socialist policies, because of those same deceiving politicians who promise to fight for the people and give you free stuff. And you're going to fall for these lies again in your adopted country? Do you think by electing politicians who will fight for the people, fight for social justice, and raise taxes on the 1% who are exploiting the wealth of the 99% that you will get ahead? In other words, will you support the same policies and vote for the same types of politicians here who made such a mess back home? The United States became wealthy because its government stayed out of the way of its citizens. The more power you give to the government, the less power you have to control your own life. Prosperity and opportunity diminish as government grows. So why did you, like so many of my fellow Guatemalans, come to the US? Because your society was broken. You chose to make a new life in the United States. You could have gone to another Latin American country with a similar culture and the same language as your home country, but you didn't. 
because the United States is different. Please help keep it that way. I'm Gloria Alvarez, author of The Populist Deception for Prager University. Every year, men spend billions of dollars to look at women with little clothing on, such as the annual Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, or with no clothing on, such as on internet sites and in so-called men's magazines. Women, on the other hand, spend virtually nothing to see unclothed men. Why? Some say that the reason is that men are socialized into viewing women as sex objects, and that women are socialized into not viewing men as sex objects. But if that's true, how do these people explain gay men? They are as aroused by pictures of naked men ah. as heterosexual men are aroused by pictures of naked women. Ah. Obviously then, it's not socialization. It's that men are programmed by nature, not by society, to respond sexually to the visual. This is an area in which men are so different from women that it's probably impossible. No, not probably, just outright impossible for a woman to truly understand. Of course women find some men attractive. And of course a woman can have an intense reaction to seeing a very appealing man. But there's still no comparison. The visual alone arouses men. It takes far more to arouse a woman than seeing naked men. If that's all it took, most husbands would walk around the house naked whenever possible, or at least every time they wanted sex. And the average heterosexual man is excited countless times a day simply by seeing women, in person, on billboards, in magazines, on television, and even in his imagination. This is not the case for women. Yes, there are some male strip shows for women. But few women ever go, and the few who do, attend them in groups, a girl's night out. And for every one of those shows, there are probably 10,000 female strip shows for males, most of whom attend alone, not as a participant in a guy's night out. Let's be honest, there is no magazine featuring men's legs for women to look at and get aroused by. But there are websites and magazines of women's legs for men. And are women paying to view topless men? Men pay good money to look at topless women. Again, that doesn't mean women never get turned on by merely looking at some men. Of course they do. But it's only some men, on rare occasion a stranger, and more usually a celebrity. Men get turned on by any side of female flesh on almost any female. The effect of the visual in men is so powerful that it even amazes men. A man came over to me after hearing me lecture on male sexuality and said, I've got a story to tell you. I was in front of a department store and the window was a seated mannequin. I couldn't believe it, but I found myself looking up her skirt. Here was a perfectly normal, responsible man who found himself looking up a skirt on an inanimate object shaped like a woman. That's how instinctive it is for men to look at female flesh. It's perfectly understandable that women cannot fully relate to this. But if a woman wants to understand male sexuality, the first thing she has to understand is the power of the visual. That's why you see ads on billboards, on TV, and in magazines for every sort of product a man might buy, accompanied by a scantily clad woman, or sometimes just part of her. I recall a famous liquor ad that showed a woman's legs and a bottle of tequila. No face, just beautiful legs. Would you ever see an ad showing men's legs? People would laugh. It would be considered absurd. An ad with women's legs is not absurd. It's alluring. None of this is in any way meant to excuse inappropriate male behavior. Men must always control themselves. But to deny the power of the visual on men is like denying that the earth is round. I'm Dennis Prager. I want to tell you about an essential vitamin you've probably never heard of. If you're a parent or plan to be one, 
It might be more important to your child's growth than all other vitamins combined, and only you, a parent, can provide it. I call it vitamin N, the word no. More and more children I find are suffering from vitamin N deficiency, and they, their parents, and our entire culture are paying the price. Let me illustrate my point with a story that's quite typical. A father, I'll call him Bill, gave his son, age five, pretty much everything the little boy asked for. Like most parents, Bill wanted more than anything for his son to be happy, but he wasn't. Instead, he was petulant, moody, and often sullen. He was also having problems getting along with other children. In addition, he was very demanding and rarely, if ever, expressed any appreciation, let alone gratitude, for all the things Bill and his wife were giving him. Was his son depressed, Bill wanted to know? Did he need therapy? His son, I told him, was suffering the predictable ill effects of being overindulged. What he needed was a healthy and steady dose of vitamin N. Overindulgence, a deficiency of vitamin N, leads to its own form of addiction. When the point of diminishing returns is passed, and it's passed fairly early on, the receiving of things begins to generate nothing but want for more things. One terrible effect of this is that our children are becoming accustomed to a material standard that's out of kilter with what they can ever hope to achieve as adults. Consider also that many, if not most, children attain this level of affluence not by working, sacrificing, or doing their best, but by whining, demanding, and manipulating. So in the process of inflating their material expectations, we also teach children that something can be had for next to nothing. Not only is that a falsehood, it's also one of the most dangerous, destructive attitudes a person can acquire. This may go a long way toward explaining why the mental health of children in the 1950s, when kids got a lot less, was significantly better than the mental health of today's kids. Since the 50s, and especially in the last few decades, as indulgence has become the parenting norm, the rates of child and teen depression have skyrocketed. Children who grow up believing in the something for nothing fairy tale are likely to become emotionally stunted, self-centered adults. Then, when they themselves become parents, they're likely to overdose their children with material things. The piles of toys, plushies, and gadgets one finds scattered around most households. In that way, overindulgence, a deficiency of vitamin N, becomes an inherited disease. An addiction passed from one generation to the next. This also explains why children who get too much of what they want rarely take proper care of anything they have. Why should they? After all, experience tells them that more is always on the way. Children deserve better. They deserve to have parents attend to their needs for protection, affection, and direction. Beyond that, they deserve to hear their parents say no far more often than yes when it comes to their whimsical desires. They deserve to learn the value of constructive creative effort as opposed to the value of effort expended whining, lying on the floor, kicking and screaming, or playing one parent against the other. They deserve to learn that work is the only truly fulfilling way of getting anything of value in life and that the harder they work, the more ultimately fulfilling the outcome. In the process of trying to protect children from frustration, parents have turned reality upside down. A child raised in this topsy-turvy fashion may not have the skills needed to stand on his or her own two feet when the time comes to do so. Here's a simple rule. Turn your children's world right side up by giving them all of what they truly need, but no more than 25% of what they simply want. I call this the principle of benign deprivation. When all is said and done, the most character-building two-letter word in the English language is no. Vitamin N. Dispense it frequently. You'll be happier in the long run, and so will your child. I'm John Rosemond, 
author and family psychologist for Prager University. Hi, I'm Marissa Streit, CEO of PragerU. Did you know that PragerU is a nonprofit? Every dollar you give will go towards making more videos and marketing them. So please consider making a donation today. Do you ever look at the lives of people around you and say, man, I wish that was me? You know you do. Everybody does. But I bet you never compared yourself to me. Haven't heard of me? I do have my own TV show in the middle of the night. When I started, I wanted to be as big as Jerry Seinfeld. I'm not. And yet, I'm a pretty happy guy. Here's why. I stopped comparing myself to other people. Seriously, that's the whole trick. Here's what I mean. If my happiness were based on being the biggest comedian in the business, I'd be mad at whoever was getting more Netflix specials than me. I have zero. If it were based on having the best TV ratings, I'd be mad at Jimmy Fallon. He beats me every night. And if it were based on being rich, I'd be mad at a lot of people. And even if I were rich, really rich, like number 10 on the Forbes 400 rich, I'd be mad that there were nine other people richer than me. It never ends. Comparing yourself to others creates a totally unrealistic measure for what constitutes success. And I know, because the entertainment business is all about unrealistic expectations. All through my career, I'd meet with satisfied customers after my shows and they'd say, hey, you're good. Maybe someday you'll be successful like Jerry Seinfeld. He's the measure of success? The top guy? When someone tells you they're a doctor, you don't say, well, maybe someday you'll cure a disease and save millions of lives, just like Jonas Salk did for polio. Or a lawyer. Oh, wow, so what's your ultimate goal? The Supreme Court? Do you see how crazy that sounds? Professional success is about making a living, pursuing excellence, and finding meaning in what you do. When I first started doing stand-up, I was a nobody. It took more than a decade playing in front of tuned-out crowds before it started paying the bills. Ten years is a lot of time to tell jokes for no money to people who aren't laughing. In those days, I spent a lot of time thinking about the comedians I admired, the guys at the top. I wanted those big sold-out houses I wasn't playing, the big paydays I wasn't making, the TV specials I wasn't doing. And not just their success, their talent. I'd look at comics like George Carlin, Robin Williams, and Louis C.K. They were all able to turn their dark, personal struggles into brilliant comedy. I envy their talent, but I wouldn't want the dark, personal struggles that went along with it. If you don't factor in everything about whoever you're comparing yourself to, you're playing a sort of mix and match game that doesn't exist in the real world. Here's one of life's little truths. Everyone is a package deal. You can't view one element of someone else's life in isolation. That's cheating. You can't say, I want Louis C.K.'s money and fame, Jay Leno's car collection, and Tom Shalhoub's wife and kids. That person doesn't exist. If he did, he'd be pretty cool. I would definitely want to hang with him. Everyone has pain in their lives. Think of anybody who you know really well. You know, the awful stuff they've had to deal with, the demons they battle. How many dead rock stars, movie stars, and yes, comedians, does it take to convince us all that everyone's life is hard? Face it, you really don't want someone else's life. You want your own life, only better. But that's the thing. You can make your life better by not doing something. Comparing yourself to other people. Back when I was a nobody, I wanted to sell out the biggest venues and have a primetime TV show with millions of viewers. Now I sell out small venues, and I'm on in the middle of the night with half a million viewers. And I appreciate every one of them. I guess when I compare myself now to myself then, I'm doing okay. You should try it. I'm Tom Shalhoub for Prager University. Let's discuss an important concept from economics the Laffer Curve. This concept is named after the man who developed it, Arthur Laffer, a major American economist who has taught at the University of Chicago, University of Southern California, and elsewhere. The Laffer Curve illustrates the two most important things we need to know about taxes. 
how much money the government can raise from taxes, and at what level of taxation the government might start getting less, not more, revenue. The Laffer curve is illustrated here by a two-dimensional graph. The horizontal line is the tax rate that the government chooses, and the vertical line is the revenue that the government receives from that tax rate. First, because zero times any number is zero, if the tax rate is zero, then the government receives zero revenue. Accordingly, zero, zero is our first point on the curve. Now suppose the government chooses a very small tax rate, say 1%. The government will then begin to receive some revenue from citizens. This means that another point in the curve must be something like this. Now suppose the government charges a 2% tax rate. Then everyone would agree that it will receive even more revenue, which means that another point in the curve must be something like this. And if the government keeps raising the rate, then revenue will continue to go up, at least when we're in the low tax rate part of the graph. This means that if we fill in the curve, it has an upward slope, at least when we're in the low tax rate part of the graph. Now suppose the government charges a 100% tax rate. If this happens, then no one would work. That is, why would anyone work when the government is going to take all the money that they make? And if no one works, then national income would be zero. This means that government revenue would be 100% of zero or zero. This means that another point of the curve must be here. Now, let's complete the curve. When we do, we see that the curve must have a hump. That is, it could look like this, or this, or this. But it has to have a hump. This is simply because the revenue line has to go up in the low tax rate part of the graph, and it has to start going down to reach the point we drew at the 100% tax rate. But if the curve slopes downward, it implies something remarkable, something that few of those who push for higher and higher taxes want to admit. It means that when tax rates are high, if you make them higher, you'll actually bring in less revenue to the government. This has, in fact, occurred in practice. For instance, during the Great Depression, when Congress passed the Holly Smoot Tariff Bill, Although the bill raised taxes on imported goods, the revenue that came from those taxes actually decreased. A more recent example occurred in the early 1980s, after President Reagan and Congress drastically reduced the tax rates on the rich, the tax revenue that came from the rich actually increased. All economists, even the most left-wing ones, agree that the true Laffer curve, the one that reflects real life, has a hump. Now, therefore, the curve has a downward sloping part, meaning at some point, tax revenues start going down when you increase rates. So where then do economists disagree? They disagree about exactly where the hump occurs. When I took my first economics class in 1984 at Stanford University, the textbook said that the hump occurs somewhere around the 70% tax rate. But apparently, I was taught something wrong. New evidence from an unexpected source suggests that the hump occurs at a much lower tax rate, something around 33%. That source is a study by Christina Romer and her husband, David Romer. Both are economics professors at the University of California, Berkeley. Christina Romer was the chairman of President Barack Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. In other words, the study was written by one of the most influential liberal economists in the United States, and it was published in the American Economic Review, the most widely respected economics journal in the world. The study examined how national income responds to tax rates. But as far as what concerns us here, the key point is that if you do the math, the results imply that the hump on the Laffer curve occurs where the tax rate is around 33%, much lower than economists previously thought. Let's now put these findings into political terms. They suggest that no matter what your politics, you should not want tax rates to be above 33%. Obviously, conservatives and many moderates think rates should be lower than that, but even if you are an extreme left-winger and your only goal is to make government as big as possible, you should still oppose a tax rate higher than 33%. The reason is that, as the Romer and Romer study suggests, when tax rates go higher than that, the government actually gets less money. Everyone of every political persuasion should pay attention to the Romer and Romer study and its important implications. They suggest 
that if we decrease tax rates, government revenues might actually rise. I'm Tim Grossclose, professor of political science and economics at UCLA for Prager University. Many people believe that free market capitalism is selfish, even immoral. They say it's about greed, about hunger for money and power, that it helps the rich and hurts the poor. They're wrong. The free market is not only economically superior, it is morally superior to any other way of organizing economic behavior. Here's why. The free market calls for voluntary actions between individuals. There's no coercion. In a free market, if I want something from you, I have to do something for you. Let's say I mow your lawn and you pay me $20. What does that $20 really mean? When I go to the grocer and say, I would like to have four pounds of steak, he in effect says to me, you want a lot of people to serve you, ranchers, truckers, butchers, and packagers. All these people have to be paid. What did you do to serve your fellow man? Well, I say, I mowed my fellow man's lawn. And the grocer says, prove it. Then I offer him the $20. Think of the money that you've earned as a certificate of performance. It's proof that you've served your fellow man. People accuse the free market of not being moral because they say it's a zero-sum game, like poker, where if you win, it means that I have to lose. But the free market is not a zero-sum game. It is a positive-sum game. You do something good for me, such as give me that steak, and I'll do something good for you, give you $20. I'm better off because I value the steak more than I value the $20, and the grocer is better off because he valued the $20 more than he valued the steak. We both win. Ironically, it's the government, not the free market, that creates zero-sum games in our economy. If you use the government to get a food stamp, a farm subsidy, or a business bailout, you will benefit, but at the expense of your fellow citizens. Isn't it more moral to require that people serve their fellow man in order to have a claim on what he produces, rather than not serve others and still have a claim? But a lot of people ask, what about giant corporations? Don't they have too much power over our lives? Not in a free market. Because in a free market, we the people decide the fate of companies who want our business. Free market capitalism will punish a corporation that does not satisfy customers or fails to use resources efficiently. Businesses, big and small, that wish to prosper are held accountable by the people who vote with their dollars. And again, it's the government that can undo this. Take the example of the American automobile industry. It was struggling to survive in 2009. Why? Because they were producing cars that did not please a sufficient number of their fellow men. In a free market, they would therefore have gone bankrupt. The market would have said, look, you're done. Sell your plant and equipment to somebody who can do a better job. But when Chrysler and General Motors failed, they went to Washington, D.C. and got the government to bail them out. The government bailout essentially meant to them, you don't have to be accountable to customers and stockholders. No matter how inferior your product is, and no matter how inefficient you are, we'll keep you in business by taking your fellow man's money. When the government interferes in this way, it takes the power away from the people and rewards companies that couldn't compete successfully in the marketplace. That may work out very well for politicians, big unions, and corporate officers, but it seldom does for the taxpayer. That's why a free market system can only work if there is limited government. Limited government means you and I decide which businesses survive. That's the America that our founding fathers envisioned, a limited government that has only a few specifically mentioned or enumerated powers that are listed in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. 
It's this brilliant limited government notion that produced the wealthiest nation in history. In a free market, the ambition and the voluntary effort of citizens, not the government, drives the economy. That is, people, to the best of their ability, shaping their own destiny. Sounds pretty moral to me. I'm Walter Williams of George Mason University for Prager University. Hi, I'm Alicia Krauss, Director of Outreach here at PragerU. To have this video reach more people, please consider a donation. Are colleges across America rife with racism, sexism, and homophobia? If you answer, no, that's absurd, you probably have a fair amount of common sense. If you answer, yes, you're probably a college administrator. Wait, you might ask, college administrators accuse their own schools of being racist, sexist, and homophobic? How does that make any sense? To understand how a college administrator thinks, you must first, as the popular saying goes, follow the money. If you do, you will not only discover why college administrators declare their own colleges racist, sexist, and homophobic, but also why, if you're a student, your tuition keeps going up, and why, if you're a parent, your bank balance keeps going down. Here's how it works. If colleges are racist, sexist, and homophobic, the only way to change that, if you're a college administrator, is to create a massive diversity bureaucracy. And that, of course, is massively expensive. No institution provides a more vivid example than the University of California, a once great university system which is self-destructing in the name of diversity. The diversity ideology has encroached upon every aspect of the University of California's collective psyche and mission. It is the one constant in every university endeavor. It impinges on hiring, distorts the curriculum, and sucks up vast amounts of faculty time and taxpayer money. Even the university's ongoing budget problems have not touched it. Since 2010, UC San Francisco, UC San Diego, and UCLA have all created new vice chancellorships in diversity, equity, and inclusion, with salaries starting at a quarter million dollars a year or higher. Each of these new posts is wildly redundant, yet each new diversity position inevitably generates an even greater surge of junior bureaucrats, all sucking in tuition dollars. In 2011, UC Berkeley's Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion presided over a staff of 17. Yet just one year later, his staff had ballooned to 24. No wonder the number of administrators at the University of California almost equals that of the faculty. Here's an only partial list of the diversity bureaucracy at UC San Diego. The Associate Vice Chancellor for Faculty Equity the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Diversity, the Staff Diversity Liaison, the Undergraduate Student Diversity Liaison, the Graduate Student Diversity Liaison, the Chief Diversity Officer, the Director of Development for Diversity Initiatives, the Director of the Cross-Cultural Center, the Director of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Resource Center, the Director of the Women's Center, these diversity bureaucrats place nonstop pressure on departments to hire on the basis of race, gender, and sexual preference. Their trick is to set the hiring bar low enough to scoop in more female and minority candidates, and then declare that anyone above that bar is qualified enough to trump the most qualified candidate when that candidate is a white or Asian male. But sometimes even that evisceration of standards isn't enough. In that case, the administration simply creates a new hiring category. In September 2012, after UC San Diego's electrical and computer engineering faculty refused to hire a mediocre female professor whom the administration had tried to force on them, the engineering school announced that it would be creating a, quote, excellence position the school's Orwellian phrase for women and minorities who cannot get hired, 
even after hiring standards have been lowered. Remember, these machinations are all in the service of a problem that doesn't exist. It's entirely fabricated. UC's campuses, like colleges throughout America, are easily the most welcoming and inclusive social environments in human history, at least if you're not a conservative. Female and minority students are surrounded by caring adults who are dedicated to their academic success. They enjoy opportunities for learning and self-development that are the envy of the world. As for the faculty, the idea that any academic department would reject the most qualified candidate simply because that candidate was black, Hispanic, female, or gay is absurd. Not to mention an entirely gratuitous insult to every faculty member on the hiring committees. Universities should be the institution in society that is the most dedicated to reason and evidence-based decisions. But with their crusade against their own make-believe racism and sexism, UC and almost every other American university betray that ideal every day. I'm Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. The London newspaper, The Daily Mail, listed the top 10 problems experienced by couples on vacation together. And topping the list was the man looking at other women in bikinis on the beach. Now, in another Prager University course, I explained the sexual power of the visual on men. And as I show, and as anyone readily understands, unless they've been misled by a politically correct college course, the power of the visual to excite men has no analog in women. Women don't get excited by virtually every male body at the beach. Male legs don't turn them on like female legs turn men on, etc., mm. etc. Et it takes massive willpower, in fact, for a heterosexual man not to look at bikini-clad women. And few men, even the nicest, finest, and most monogamously faithful and loving, have such willpower. So the Daily Mail notes, this frequently causes problems when a couple's itinerary includes a visit to the beach. And what exactly is the problem? The problem is that the wife or girlfriend feels threatened by his looking. And why does she feel threatened? Because she thinks he is comparing her to those women. And why does this disturb her? Here are three reasons. First, virtually every woman, no matter how attractive, thinks that when her man is looking at other women, other women in general, and in bikinis especially, he is finding them more attractive than her. Second, she thinks that he is therefore dissatisfied with her, which in turn arouses the unspoken but primal fear that he might leave her. And third, she is sure that her man will continue to think about these women long after they've disappeared from sight. So now let's analyze these reasons. First, does the husband or boyfriend find these women on the beach, or for that matter anywhere else, more attractive than he finds his wife or girlfriend? Well, since I believe that only honesty works in the long run, the answer is sometimes yes. He may very well find some of those women more physically attractive than his woman. But here's the point that most women, again, understandably don't know. With very few exceptions, it doesn't matter. You heard me right. Of course, when looking at these other women, he may find some of them more physically attractive than the woman he's with. But, and here's the good news, so what? Presuming he is attracted to you, and if he isn't, it doesn't matter if you're vacationing in a monastery and all he sees are monks. He wants you. I repeat, he wants you. And if he does, all those other women don't amount to a hill of beans. There's another thing women need to know. Within seconds of her disappearing from view, he has no memory of any of these women. When in sight, they can take over his male mind. But out of sight, they are out of mind. It's as if they never existed. Yes, the visual gets men's total attention in a matter of seconds. But as soon as the woman he was focused on vanishes, most men forget what they saw in an equal number of seconds. Why does this come as news and hard to believe news at that to most women? Because you, the woman, remember the women your man looked at. And you therefore think that he too remembers them. But let me assure you, he doesn't. Most men under torture couldn't identify the women they looked at the hour before, let alone the day before, if they were shown photos of them along with photos of women they had never seen. And more good news. 
His seeing women who he thinks for that moment are more attractive than you has no bearing whatsoever on his being quote-unquote dissatisfied with you. Men find other women attractive in large measure just because they are other women. Men are programmed by nature to want variety. Indeed, endless variety. That's why God-fearing King Solomon had 700 wives and another 300 concubines, and secular Hugh Hefner had at least that many lovers. In some then, when your man looks at these other, perhaps even more attractive women, he is A, not comparing you to them, B, not in any way becoming dissatisfied with you, and C, certainly not thinking of them later. He looks at them because they are other women whether they are more attractive, just as attractive, or less attractive. They are women in bikinis, so he looks. Where there is basic domestic harmony and mutual physical attraction, more than anything your husband wants you. When he looks, he isn't comparing, he isn't getting dissatisfied, and he won't have a clue later as to who he saw. So when you're back in your hotel room, put on your own bikini and tell him you want him. Because, again, more than anyone else in the world, he wants you. And if you don't believe me, ask him. You'll be glad you did, and so will he. I'm Dennis Prager. I'm Jared Sechelle, PragerU's Director of Communications. Did you know that PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit and relies entirely on donations from viewers like you? To ensure that more young Americans see these videos, please consider making a donation today. Thank you for your support.